Today we're going to talk about chapter 14 from our book, which is about analyzing results. And let me start by saying that packing several semesters of statistics classes into one chapter is utterly ridiculous. But let's get this party started. And we start by talking about scales of measurement. This is the third time we've been over scales of measurement. So here we go. Nominal scales, again, um, show difference, but not a quantifiable difference. So you can sort pictures into attractive and unattractive categories, although it hurts people's feelings. An ordinal scale measures the magnitude. Uh, so relative magnitude, whenever you see ranks, think ordinal scale. I'm going to kind of zip through these because we've had it several times before. An interval scale, um, it uses equal intervals, but no absolute zero point. We've talked about that, so it's like your Fahrenheit and centigrade. Uh, ratio scales uh, does have equal intervals and an absolute zero. So uh, you can make proportional statements. This is something like uh, temperature measured in degrees Kelvin. Okay, here's the new information then, or starting with new information. Uh, Non-parametric tests use nominal or ordinal data, and parametric tests require interval or ratio. Generally, we prefer parametric statistics uh, because we can do more sophisticated analyses of the data. Um, parametric statistics are based on a normal curve. Uh, we can do further analyses um, with them. So let's start talking about the chi-square test. If the data are nominal and the groups are independent, um, you use a chi-square. So it's a non-parametric test because it's using nominal data. The chi-square test determines whether the frequency of the sample represents frequencies we would expect in the population. So I can give you an example from my own research on comedians. So we have a list that was compiled by Comedy Central of the 100 top stand-up comedians of all time. And so we look for demographic information um, about each of those 100 stand-up comedians. One of the things we were interested in was birth order. So who's the funniest? Uh, and does birth order make a difference? Because researchers like Alfred Adler would say it does. Who's the highest ranking? Uh, people who are only children, people who are oldest children, people who are middle children, and pe or people who are youngest children. And uh, what we found was that only children were overrepresented in the sample compared to their percentage in the population as a whole. Uh, and that's why we named our paper Only Children, Funniest of the Funny. So the number one comedian on the list was Richard Pryor, and, uh, for example, and he is, um, or was, I should say, an only child. So what we do then, basically you compare expected versus observed frequencies to do a chi-square. So the expected frequencies of only children in the population versus um, observed frequencies among our comedians. And that's what this is um, suggesting. Um, if our sample includes every member of the population, we have the maximum possible numbers of degrees of freedom. So that's right. So degrees of freedom is the number of scores free to vary in a distribution. Here's a critical slide. Uh, it's actually, it's not just greater than, it's if our, chi, if the, our obtained chi-square is greater or equal to our uh, critical value for chi-square, um, then we're, um, we reject the null hypothesis. What's being unsaid here is that if our chi-square, our obtained chi-square is less than our um, critical chi-square, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, but this, I mean, this slide is correct. If our obtained value is greater or equal to our critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. I'll say the other side of it again. If our obtained value is less than our critical value, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Well, let's switch to t-tests then. Um, how does sample size determine the uh, degrees of freedom? Well, t-scores are like z-scores, uh, but z-scores, if you remember z-scores from um, other classes, uh, but z-scores are based on an infinite number of observations and a known population mean and standard deviation. 
So these T scores, let me say that again, T distributions begin to approximate Z distributions as you add more degrees of freedom, which uh, this chart uh, kind of shows too. So uh, the T distribution approaches the normal curve as sample size um, increases. What does robustness mean? Uh, the T provides a valid test of the hypothesis when assumptions like normal distribution of the population values are slightly to moderately violated. This is because uh, the peak of a T distribution is flatter and the tails are more elongated than in a Z distribution. And so you have to go out further into an area of rejection. When can we reject the null hypothesis? Well, like the chi-square test, when our T obtained is greater or equal to our T critical, we reject the null hypothesis. And conversely, when our T obtained is less than our T critical, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. How do we calculate an effect size for um, an independent group's t-test? Well, uh, that's how you would do it, sure. If you want to calculate an effect size, that's the formula, and um, you can figure it out there. Uh, an R value of 0.50 uh, is considered, or higher, is considered a large effect. Um, so if we square R with 0.66, that squares to 0.435, so we round up, 44% of the variance is accounted for. Um, that's a pretty huge effect size, um, I'm here to tell you. What's a t-test for matched groups? Um, essentially, this is a within subjects or within groups design, uh, also called a repeated measures t-test or a paired groups t-test. Uh, someone really needs to standardize this nomenclature because things are called different things in different classes. Uh, t-test for matched groups uses fewer uh, people. You get greater control. Each person's their own control um, if you're not matching people. Uh, yes, we talked about this when discussing within subjects, within groups designs, and between subjects, between groups designs. Essentially, within subjects, within groups designs, they have some overwhelming advantages. And so if we can use them, we do. What about analysis of variance? Uh, well, t-tests are for when we have two groups. Analysis of variance is when we have three or more groups, or uh, uh, two or more independent variables, so factorials. Uh, what are uh, within-group variability and between-group variability? Um, Within group variability is the degree to which scores of subjects in the same treatment group differ from each other. So it's how different you are from the people in your group. That's what within group variability is. Between group variability is the degree to which scores of different treatment groups differ from one, one another and the grand mean. So between group variability is how different the treatment groups are from each other. So what you want is minimal within group variability. So you have nice, tight, clearly differentiated distributions, and you want maximal between-group variability because you want the independent variable to have had an effect. What are the sources of within-group and between-group variability? Uh, they looks like there's a lot of overlap there. Basically, between-group variability encompasses treatment effects or the impact of the independent variable. That's the thing to keep in mind. What does it mean when the F ratio is statistically significant? Well, uh, across all the group means, there's a significant difference due to the independent variable. That would be nice to find. When can you reject the null hypothesis? Well, like in the chi-square and the T, when the F obtained is greater or equal to the F critical, we reject the null hypothesis. Conversely, when the F obtained is less than the F critical, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. What's a post hoc test and when is it appropriate? Um, well, if you've made no specific predictions, you can perform post hoc tests. So you could use the Tukey HSD, uh, which HSD stands for Honest Significant Difference Test, or you could do a Bonferroni test. Um, I, I, I love Chef Bonferroni. 
Um, I love his pasta in a can, if you've ever had that. How many comparisons can we perform? Well, all possible pairwise comparisons, and you don't increase the risk of a type 1 error by doing that. So live it up. What about a priori tests? Um, this is basically your predicted hypotheses, um, which are more powerful. Um, oh, and that's what it says here. They're more powerful than post hoc tests, but you can perform fewer of them. So there's always a trade-off, isn't there? And we'll finish up with uh, effect size measured by eta squared. Um, eta squared does measure effect size, and it's really analogous to r squared, which we've talked about. Uh, before. So that is several semesters of statistics in one chapter, and that wraps up chapter 14, and what a chapter, really. Um, but thanks for listening.